YRC berada di lokasi strategis yang dilewati oleh jalur busway koridor 2 dan 3 sehingga mudah dicapai dari berbagai arah. YRC mempunyai ruang kuliah amfiteater dengan fasilitas nyaman dalam mengikuti. Link net 24, kecepatan tinggi tanpa dipungut biaya. Secara cepat. Kami memiliki perpustakaan cetak dan digital yang sangat lengkap, sehingga dengan perkembangan ilmu terbaru. Yarsi memiliki fakultas kedokteran ilmu, kedokteran gigi, akuntansi, manajemen, ilmu, teknik informatika, psikologi dan ilmu perpustakaan. Yarsi memiliki fasilitas pendukung yang sangat modern, sehingga para calon dokter bisa mempelajari berbagai hal seperti dalam kenyataan yang sebenarnya. Kami memiliki tujuan untuk menciptakan dokter muslim yang kompeten dan profesional. Fakultas kedokteran kami tidak hanya menerapkan kompetensi inti nasional dari pemerintah, tapi juga menambahkan dua kompetensi lain dalam kurikulumnya, yaitu pemecah masalah dan dokter muslim. Dua kompetensi tambahan ini penting agar nantinya para dokter tidak hanya paham dalam pengetahuan, tapi juga dibekali bekal agama dalam pemecahan masalah sehari-hari dalam pelayanan mereka kepada negara dan masyarakat. Jadi, semua kompetensi ditinjau dari sudut pandang Islam. Di YRC, mahasiswa akan dipersiapkan tidak hanya unggul di dalam negeri, tapi juga bisa bersaing secara global. Karena kami sudah mempersiapkan menghadapi MEA dengan membuat kerjasama riset dengan universitas ternama di luar negeri, memberikan beasiswa, melakukan program pertukaran pelajar dengan universitas di luar negeri, dan tentu saja memasukkannya di dalam program perkuliahan. Untuk mendukung perkuliahan, kami memiliki laboratorium modern di dalam setiap fakultas. Dengan laboratorium terpadu yang kami miliki, kami bisa melakukan berbagai penelitian yang bertujuan memberikan kontribusi nyata di bidang ilmu pengetahuan dan bermanfaat bagi masyarakat luas. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat datang di Universitas Yarsi. Kita mempunyai pusat-pusat penelitian yang merupakan advanced research center. Antara lain adalah pusat penelitian genomik, pusat penelitian sel punca, pusat penelitian herbal, dan ada pusat penelitian halal. Kita ingin nanti semua center-center ini menghasilkan penelitian-penelitian yang dapat dimanfaatkan oleh negara ini, sehingga bukan hanya pengembangan keilmuan, tapi juga pengembangan hasil-hasil yang bisa meningkatkan kesejahteraan masyarakat dan bangsa Indonesia. Saya Tri Noviati, biasa saya dipanggil Novi. Saya angkatan 1979 dan tahun 2013, Alhamdulillah saya diberi amanah oleh pemerintah DKI untuk menjadi Direktur Rumah Sakit Umum Daerah Pasar Rebo. Semoga lulusan Yarsi menjadi dokter muslim yang mampu berkompetensi di level nasional maupun internasional. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bapak Ibu sekalian. Tes, tes. Bapak 
Ibu sekalian uh, sebelum acara dimulai kami ingin uh, bantuan partisipasi Bapak Ibu sekalian untuk me uh, membuat uh, HP silent mode agar acara ini bisa berjalan dengan uh, baik dan uh,
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udzu billahi minasy syaithanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa nunazzilu minal Qur'ani ma huwa shifa. wa rahmatul lil mu'minin wa Sanakallahu'l-azim. Aku berlindung kepada Allah dari godaan syaitan yang terkutuk. Dengan menyebut nama Allah yang maha pengasih lagi maha penyayang. Dan kami turunkan dari Al-Quran sesuatu yang menjadi penawar dan rahmat bagi orang-orang yang beriman. Dan Al-Quran itu tidaklah menambah kepada orang-orang yang zalim selain kerugian. Maha benar Allah dengan segala firmannya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih, Pak. And now, uh, audience, please stand up for playing the national anthem Indonesia Raya. <laughs>
please be seated. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Yoga Aditama, pulmonologist, consultant, to give the opening speech. Baik, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sebelum opening speech ada dua. Yang pertama ini nggak nggak usah terlalu resmi-resmi banget begitu ya. Jadi kita santai-santai aja. Nggak perlu terlalu formal. Tentu saja yang uh, 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 pembacaan ayat suci dan uh, apa namanya Indonesia saya sudah selesai. Jadi kita nggak formal-formal banget itu. Dan yang kedua saya ngomong bahasa Indonesia aja ya. Biarin aja Bu Mukta ini nggak nggak ngerti ini belakang seru seru. <laughs> kita ngomong ini dia nggak ngerti nggak apa-apa lah biarin aja. <laughs> so you 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 get you get the feel okay. Uh, jadi teman-teman sekalian, ada tiga hal yang ingin saya sampaikan. Nomor satu, kita bicara soal pandemi COVID saat ini luar biasa, walaupun sekarang ada kejadian di Cianjur yang seperti disampaikan tadi, ada KLB polio di mana-mana, eh, di, bukan di mana-mana, di Aceh, tapi tetap pandemi COVID merupakan hal yang tidak bisa dikendalikan begitu sampai hari ini. Jadi orang sudah sangat apa luluh lantak lah karena pandemi COVID. Tapi sebenarnya selain pandemi COVID, ada yang disebut sebagai silent, silent pandemic, yaitu antimikrobial resistant ini. Itu poin. Jadi antimikrobial resistant ini bisa mengancam lebih banyak lagi jiwa karena kita tahu kalau dia resisten maka infeksi tidak bisa diobati lagi. Kalau ada tindakan nggak bisa dilakukan dan sebagainya. Dan karena itu maka sejak beberapa tahun yang lalu, when was the wow begin? Three years ago, four years ago, I think ya. Yeah. When I was there ya. Yeah. Oke, okay. jadi sekitar empat tahun yang lalu WHO menetapkan ada hari anti an, tadinya namanya hari antibiotik sedunia World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Eh belakangan menjadi World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Seminggu dalam setahun ditetapkan sebagai hari itu eh minggu itu supaya pengetahuan masyarakat tentang antimikrobial itu ditingkatkan. Dan kebetulan uh, ini ter, terjadi tanggal 18 to 24, di sini. 18 sampai 24 November dan saya ketemu Bu Mukta ini beberapa waktu yang lalu di salah satu pertemuan saya bilang kenapa enggak kita manfaatkan uh, lakukan kegiatan di YRC untuk World Antibacterial Awareness Week itu karena itulah kita berbesar hati Dokter Mukta hadir di sini Dokter Mukta ini adalah namanya Team Leader of MR dari so people ask me why why we put it WCO because people know that, that you are WCO so WCO stand for, I mean, kepanjangan dari WHO Indonesia sebenarnya. Saya dulu lama-lama lama sama-sama dengan Bu Mukta ini, dan yang menarik adalah pada waktu perpisahan, ini ini yang dua kali juga nggak tahu, pada waktu perpisahan yang dikasih oleh timnya Bu Mukta ke saya itu semacam kayak sajadah besar dari Kashmir. So you can translate to her little. Jadi, 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 jadi itu ya, it, ya. Karena beliau dari Kashmir memang asalnya. Walaupun dia warga negara Inggris, jadi warga negara Inggris, orang India warga negara Inggris itu bisa jadi perdana menteri Inggris. Jadi kita, saya kira nggak lama lagi Bu Mukta akan jadi Minister of Health dari UK. <laughs> itu yang pertama. Yang kedua, kenapa saya undang tim dari WHO? Karena saya terus terang saja lebih ingin memperkenalkan YRC kepada lebih banyak orang luar. Begitu, mulai sekarang kita ada kegiatan bisa langsung langsung uh, uh, offline seperti ini makanya sengaja saya undang untuk datang ke YRC tidak dengan ini walaupun acara kita ada dua bisa dan diikuti juga oleh orang lain tapi sengaja saya undang kemari makanya sesudah ini saya sudah sampaikan Bu Mukta tadi ada perwakilan dari rumah sakit jadi kalau bisa akan mampir ke rumah sakit sebentar saja sambil jalan karena dia sore ini akan pergi ke kemana Kartum kemana mungkin ke Oman gitu jadi sambil jalan nanti rumah sakit jadi kita perlihatkan inilah universitas yang keren ini gitu nggak usah dibilang nggak usah diterjemahin dan itu rumah sakit yang itu dan, dan oke okay, itu yang yang kedua ada yang ketiga selamat kita mengikuti acara hari ini mudah-mudahan bermanfaat so dr mukta thank you for coming to this university so uh, so you, you can you can get the feeling what is a quote in quote a middle class uh, hospital and middle class university in Indonesia you, I, I know you have seen the University of Indonesia which is the, the state state owned university but you, you you now you thank you for coming to this uh, university and thank you for giving the lecture to 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 this is not only the master and phd student but I, some somebody some from a hospital and some from others and we have two vice rector here and this one vice rector is a biomedical uh, 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 
PhD and the other one already uh, 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 introduced to you. He is a medical doctor, but also a heart uh, religious expert, etc. So thank you. And after this, uh, you can just drop by at the hospital to see what the hospital is. And that hospital is not only hospital of YRC because all of Indonesian diplomat, if they get sick, they, they will go here. Just to let you know, the, 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 the vice ambassador of Indonesia in Delhi during the Delta was sick. And, 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 and he and his wife was transported here, but uh, unfortunately he passed away here. But anyway, so this is the hospital for the diplomat. Yesterday I also received a guest, the uh, ASEAN director from the Minister of Health. He was also admitted to the FDA, so just to give you. And lastly, uh, uh, I have to thank you for you to, to be a guest speaker, but I have to also be a, a guest speaker in the International Conference of Health and Research. Uh, uh, held by Brin. I think WHO should also have a collaboration with Brin. Yeah, so uh, I will have, uh, I have to speak there between 9.45 to 10.15. So excuse me, I have to, I have to, to have that speak. But again, terima kasih, Bu Mukta. And I do hope that you can uh, 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 quote unquote have a fruitful meeting here in university as well as at hospital. And we in the Universitas of YRC feel very happy to support WHO country office in any way we can. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh, saya harus buka. Kita buka sama-sama. Oke, okay, terima kasih. Terima kasih, Pro. Thank you, Pro. Uh, may Allah mengijabah doanya. Amin. Uh, and then, now we proceed the lecture. This presentation will be delivered by Dr. Mukta Sharma, PhD. And also uh, guided with the Pak Ahmad. We invite all distinguished speaker and moderator to come to the to come forward, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. Uh, thank you, Prof. Chandra, for the nice uh, light notes <laughs> to make this informal. <laughs> And thank you for the vice rectors and thank you uh, to Prof. Fasri Jala. Uh, I believe uh, he is joining us uh, through online. And, and Prof. Journalist, yes, and Prof. Journalist. Uh, thank you, Prof. Journalist, for coming and giving us our support. And of course, uh, to our fellow um, lecturers, uh, clinicians, and of course, our beloved students, welcome to our uh, distinguished uh, lecture of, from uh, Dr. Mukta Sharma. Um, I guess he doesn't need lots of introduction, but I probably note something very interesting in her education. She earned her doctorate from London School of Economics and Political Science in the social science of HIV. I myself is a biomedical scientist, uh, Dr. Sharma, and it just dawned on me, apparently when it comes to disease, you don't need only the clinicians, but you also need somebody who can look at the social aspect of it. And it's very interesting. Um, I also uh, had an, a chance to attend an epidemiology course at Simeo Tropnet in Malaysia just recently. And I also learned a lot about communicable disease. And students, please take this opportunity to really take good notes. My job will be to moderate questions, right? It's very interesting to have very important guests here. So don't miss out the opportunity to ask, you know, Kapan lagi ya kita punya pakar yang bisa datang tiap hari uh, di di RC. Jadi please take a good notes and ask question. Hopefully we can learn a lot for the next. I think we have to make a contract here. How long? <laughs> um, twenty minutes. Let's we'll speak for twenty minutes. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. I think uh, there is not really limitation, uh, Doc. But uh, I really want, want the students to have a pay a good attention. All right, uh, I believe it's going to be a video that will be shown first. Uh, so let's uh, look at the video. And uh, afterwards, we're going to welcome Dr. Sharma to give uh, her lecture. Thank you. Waktu itu, saya sendirian sih. Jadi saya nggak tahu resisten obat itu apa sih, kenapa harus efeknya sampai sekuat ini? Kenapa saya harus ada di level ini? Kenapa saya nggak sembuh? Kenapa banyak sekali pertanyaan sih?
pas suatu ketika pas mau batuk ya udah batuk saya pikir kayak biasa ada hak aja yang keluar ternyata darah ya pada saat itu yang kepikiran cuma satu sih ini kayak nggak akan tolong nih ini kayaknya udah udah at the end of my life lah istilahnya seperti itu saya ingat tanggal 28 Agustus 2012 saya memulai pengobatan TB resisten obat di uh, RSUP persahabatan dengan 15 butir obat yang harus saya telan setiap hari lalu waktu itu kan masih suntik ya jadi saya dapat suntik juga di bokong kanan kiri setiap hari AGP itu meningkatkan resistensi terhadap antibiotik yang diberikan terhadap ayam untuk mengobati penyakitnya. Transisi dari AGP menuju sesuatu yang organik itu memakan waktu sekitar 8 bulan sampai 1 tahun di tempat saya. Dan itu membutuhkan waktu untuk peternak menemukan rumus nutrisi yang tepat supaya bisa menggantikan AGP lebih efektif. Saat AGP dilarang, peternak berlomba-lomba untuk mencari alternatif yang didapatkan dari uh, organik. Contohnya seperti jahe atau bahan baku organik lainnya yang biasa kita temukan di jejamuan. Keunggulan saat ini setelah kita meninggalkan AGP adalah ayam cenderung terlihat lebih segar. Lalu bau makanan yang dikonsumsi dengan mereka juga berasa lebih wangi dibanding kalau kita menggunakan zat-zat kimia. Yang bisa saya sarankan pada peternak adalah menerapkan biosecurity tiga zona, manajemen peternakan sesuai dengan industri peternakan, dan menggunakan antimikroba dengan berkonsultasi dengan dokter hewan. Assalamualaikum, selamat pagi dan selamat sehat. I would like to greet all of you, including those who are joining us by, uh, by, by video. But I'd like to pay my respects to uh, the director of ERC Hospital, uh, Pak Mulyadi. I would also like to pay respects to Professor Journalis Udin, who I believe is joining uh, virtually. Uh, my greetings also to Professor Fasli Jalal, uh, to, to uh, Dr. Ahmad, who's here with us, and all colleagues here. But particularly, I'd like to greet my previous boss and my neighbor, Professor Aditama. He thanked me for coming here today, but actually I should be thanking him because he is the biggest champion for antimicrobial resistance prevention, not just here in Indonesia, where he has helped to open doors for us 
at WHO. He guides me, he tells me where I can speak, he gives me opportunities to speak and engage. So I'd like to say to him, even though he's not here, that his guidance is very important to us. Um, and and uh, the enthusiasm that he brings to it is something that we all need. And we need to become more like him. We need to become champions for health in the same way that he is. Um, we need many, many more Pak Aditamas. And I hope that today, by the time I finish speaking with you, some of you will decide to become champions to protect your children, your families, your friends from the problems that antimicrobial resistance can cause. So because I work for WHO, I would like to share with you some guidance, some information about Indonesia, as well as globally about the situation, what is happening in antimicrobial resistance. I would also like to share with you some of the things that we were working on to help the doctors uh, and the patients and those who can be involved in antimicrobial stewardship. Stewardship is a big word, but maybe we can use a simpler word, guidance. How can we guide people to use antibiotics better? Those who are using it and those who are providing it, how can we do it in a way that antibiotics remain effective against the infections that we are using them for? How can we make sure that we reduce toxicity for those who are taking them? And how can we protect and save antibiotics for 10 years later, 20 years later. So we all save money. We all save things for our children. Uh, in the same way, we need to see, save antibiotics for our children. Because if we don't save them today, tomorrow, we will be in a situation where our children, maybe our parents, will suffer uselessly because infections that we can treat today, we will not be able to treat tomorrow. So I'll start with my presentation, please. And if, if you would please click on it for me, that would be very useful. I'm gonna turn a little bit so that I can see the slides. And is that okay? Everybody can hear me properly? Okay. Okay, so next, please. Oh, you want me to use a clicker? I'm so sorry, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, so this should be, next. Am I doing something wrong? Okay, so where do I need to, over there? Maybe what I'll do is, I'll give it to my friend tomorrow. Okay, and then you can see the disclosure. Okay, sorry about that. So, you know, WHO was asked a question about five years ago. What are the 10 top global threats to health? And we had climate change and emergency, war, air pollution, but antimicrobial resistance is amongst the one top 10 global health threats. Next, please. And, okay. So we see that antibiotics are used both in the human sector and in the animal sector but they are used sometimes as a substitute. They're not used to treat only disease. Sometimes we are worried about infection, that infection might happen because we don't have 
a clear diagnosis of the infection, or because we know that the patients are very poor, they may not have access to water, they may not have access to sanitation. We give people antibiotics. Doctor's not sure what to do, doesn't have a test, patient may not come back, give them antibiotics. We use antibiotics in farms so that you can have more chickens and, and, and farm uh, animals that can be sold and it allows people to, to earn a better living. So antibiotics have become a crutch that we are using even when we might be able to walk. But because we are not sure of what to do exactly, sometimes people are using antibiotics. Okay, next please. Okay, so what is the impact? Every three minutes, one child is dying of sepsis globally. We think that there are many, many, many more drug-resistant infections worldwide, but we have no reporting system. We have no national survey that will say, in Indonesia, this is the extent of drug resistance. We have no data, but we know that many, many, many people suffer. We also know that AMR is an issue which is affecting all sectors, human, animal, plant, as well as the environment. We have a situation where we don't have good wastewater management in many health facilities. The water goes into into the land, it goes into agriculture, or it goes into drinking water, and then you are imbibing bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Next, please. There is also an economic cost to antimicrobial resistance. We expect that by 2050, there will be one trillion additional dollars that are needed because of increased healthcare costs. This can drive people into poverty. We know that when people have large healthcare costs, they can be driven into poverty. We saw in COVID, for example, many people were driven into poverty. They lost jobs or economies had to shut down and people are driven into poverty. You can also see that if this carries on, there will be an impact on food security because there will be a 7.5% decline in animal livestock production. The world is growing, we need more food. We have a war in Ukraine. We don't have enough grain. We don't have enough grain to feed those animals. Now you add antibiotic resistance to it we might see food shortages. So it's an issue that is not just about infections, it's an issue that affects many things. Nearly 5 million people die every year of AMR-related mortality and morbidity. If I was to tell you what that 5 million might look like, it looks like all of the deaths with TB, HIV, malaria combined. It looks like since the COVID pandemic started two and a half years ago, we said that six and a half million people have died. But we have five million that go to AMR every year. And that is why we call it the silent pandemic. There is nobody who is worried about AMR because it is like a pot of water that you put on the slow fire and you put it at the back and it's bubbling away. So we've been very focused on COVID and the deaths. In COVID, which is a viral disease, we have given many people antibiotics when they didn't need antibiotics. 
we were worrying, oh, maybe there might be a secondary infection, give antibiotics. So we need to think very hard about how we think about AMR in the future, because there is no buddy who is saying problem, 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 and it is a silent pandemic. Next, please. Okay. Now, this may only be interesting for those of you who are interested in, in bugs. What you see on this slide is the bacteria that caused the diseases, where we are seeing the most resistance. And what you can see is that the vast majority of deaths and infections are coming from six bacteria. And they are the first six, Escherichia coli, E. coli, which is very common. Then we have Staphylococcus aureus, often seen in lower respiratory, uh, upper respiratory tract infections, Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Acinobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then next to it, that is also important, is TB, Mycobacterium TB. If we focus our attention on these six or seven bacteria and we stop resistance to these six or seven bacteria, we will be able to protect a lot of people from death, from disease. Next, please. Okay, I want to share with you data which is just been produced by uh, the Ministry of Health, NIHRD. Now it's called something else. We do in Indonesia every year a GLASS survey. GLASS stands for Global Antimicrobial uh, Resistance Reporting. And from Indonesia for the last three years, the 20 top hospitals are enrolled in GLASS. And they report the level of resistance in the hospitals. And here I'm showing you data, which is taken from blood specimens, only for two bacteria, E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. You notice that these are amongst the six bacteria that I referred to earlier in my list. And then I'm showing you the resistance to two types of antibiotics to the extended spectrum beta-lactamase, for short ESBL antibiotics, and the fluoroquinolones. You know, your fluoroquinolones are your levofloxacin, et cetera, et cetera. And you see the level of resistance. I'm asking you please to note two things here. The first, the level of resistance is already very high. And the second, the level of resistance went up hugely between 2021 and 2022. Now, these data are not perfect. Why do I say these data are not perfect? Because these are data from tertiary health facilities. Usually it is the sickest people who go to these facilities. Usually these are patients who have already been exposed to antibiotics before. So this is probably overstating the situation in Indonesia. Most antibiotics are used at the community level. Even though in a hospital you have intense use of antibiotics, most antibiotics are dispensed at the community level. And we may find that at the community level, the resistance is slightly lower, higher. We don't know. The problem is we don't know. And it is very urgent that in Indonesia, if we really want to address this problem, we need better information. Um, and, and that I think is, is a key take home message I'd like you all to take away with you. Data matters. We need this information if Indonesia is to respond appropriately to this. Next, please. Okay, so some people say, what is antimicrobial stewardship? How do you translate it into Bahasa? 
I don't know if you can help me with this. How would you translate antimicrobial stewardship into Bahasa as a good term? And we'll, 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 we'll discuss that a little bit later. How would you present this issue? Because this is a term in English, we're trying to import it. But really what it is, is a set of actions that all of us will take in the human sector, in the animal health sector, to improve the responsible use of antimicrobials. And when we improve antimicrobial use, we are responsible in how we use it. The first benefit is improved outcomes for patients. Maybe there are improved outcomes for animals as well, but animals cannot speak for themselves. So we will focus on patients here. Next, please. Okay, so I'll try and put a little bit more flesh to that. What do we mean? And why is everybody important? The doctor is the most important at the top because he's the, he or she is the prescriber. And the doctor needs to make a decision. They need to make several decisions when they prescribe antibiotics. The first is, what is the diagnosis? The second is, does this need antibiotics? Is there a bacterial infection? Is somebody who is presenting with bronchitis, actually do they have a bacterial infection or is it a viral infection? What dose shall I give? What duration shall I give? Should it be oral? Should, be, should it be injectable? So that, that is, the eight Ds that we say, and the doctor is responsible, the prescriber is responsible for making those eight decisions, the eight Ds that I will share with you later. Then you have the nurse. You also have the pharmacist who will be the bridge between the doctor and the patient. Take your drugs, how to take them, how long to take them for, how to dispose of them. You know, the pharmacist has a very important role, not just in saying, here are your medicines, but when you're better or you, your drugs are old, how do you dispose of them? Um, and then the role of the patient. It's not just the role of the health facility workers, the patient, you take your drugs. You don't push the doctor to give you medicines when the doctor says you don't need antibiotics. You don't put the doctor under pressure and say you're a bad doctor. And I will now go to the local pharmacy and I will buy azithromycin for two days and I will take it for one day when I feel better, I'll throw it into the drain from where the cow will drink the water and then you will eat the cow. Patients have a responsibility. And sometimes the patients are children or the patients are very old, they may not be able to take on this responsibility, which means the family has a responsibility, the friends have a responsibility. So you see, there's an entire set of people who need to be active. Pharmaceuticals. We have many pharmaceuticals that are producing substandard antibiotics. They are in the market. They don't have enough active ingredient and that can create problems. Or they can be saying, I just need to sell. I will sell to the pharmacists and they will then sell onwards. The sale of, of drugs without prescription because of the profit motive is something that we also have to deal with. So everybody has a role and helping people to understand their role and coordinating all of this is something which requires effort. It cannot just be done in a hospital. It is required by society. And we say AMR requires a whole of society approach 
just like we say for emergencies and pandemics. Not only the doctor can take care of COVID, you all and I are wearing masks. We are taking responsibility. We're taking responsibility for you, for me, for my family. In the same way, we have to take responsibility for AMR. Next, please. This is really a repetition of, of what I, I, I've shared with you so far. These are some WHO resources, policies, guidelines that we produce. Uh, and if you're interested, we can share those with you later. Many of these are in English, but our office is currently working on translating them into Bahasa. Next, please. Okay. I'd like to ask, how many of you have heard of the AWARE classification? Is there anybody who has met the AWARE classification till now amongst our clinicians or, or biomedical? No, okay. So I will discuss what AWARE is. But before doing that, we have every two to three years in WHO, one of the things we do is we provide a model essential medicine list. This is a list which is a global list focusing on middle income, low income countries, where we say you must have these medicines. And based on that, every country will have their own essential medicine list. This is a guarantee that these drugs will then be procured by the government and these drugs will then become available to people who need them at all levels of the health system. In this essential medicine list, we have antibiotics. Um, we started doing the first essential medicine list in 1977. The last update was done uh, in 2021. And this year, for the first time, I'm happy to share with you that WHO is producing the antibiotic book, which is part of the essential medicine list. Um, so AWARE is a classification. It stands for access, watch, and reserve. If we go to the next slide, this will make it clearer to you. So what do we want from antibiotics? What's the first thing we want from an antibiotic? We want the antibiotic to be efficacious. It should be efficacious. It should stop you from being sick from the infection that you have. The second thing we want is that it should have the least toxicity because antibiotics, Antimicrobials are not just killing the bad bacteria, they're killing the good bacteria, and they're having other side effects. And we know that some of these side effects can be severe. People can have very strong reactions to antibiotics. What is the third thing we want? We want to save antibiotics for the future. Why do we want to save antibiotics for the future? because we don't have many antibiotics in the pipeline. Pharmaceutical companies are not making antibiotics. For some of you who work in TB, you will know that in the last 70 years, only two new drugs came for TB. In many parts of the world, we are still using drugs and technology for TB. That is 100 years old. Why? How is it that we don't have the same problem for HIV drugs? Why do we have it for TB? Who gets TB? Poor people. So the pharmaceutical companies don't have any reason to make money from, from this. Why would they put millions and millions and millions of dollars into research if they're not going to be able to make money from it? So at the moment, there's very few candidate antimicrobials, particularly antibiotics in the pipeline. So that is why our third principle, the first one remember is efficacy, least toxicity, and the third one is to save antibiotics for the future. 
because till we have new antibiotics, we need to maximize the use of what we have today. So access antibiotics are antibiotics that can be used for most common infectious syndromes. These have a lower resistance potential. Then you have the watch antibiotics. These have a higher resistance potential and they should be used when access antibiotics are not working. At the top in red are the reserve antibiotics. And these are your last resort antibiotics. When these don't work, a patient will die. So these are our most precious antibiotics. These are the ones we need to protect the most. And these are also the fewest. There are very few reserve antibiotics. Okay, so the classification, access, watch, reserve, is basically a classification, a framework to help us to think about the responsible use of antibiotics. Next, please. And I'm happy to share with you that today we have in the 22nd essential medicine list, there are 39 antibiotics out of the 479 medicines that are on the list. And I'm sharing with you the list of the access watch and reserve groups. You will see that the most number is access 2021, and then we have uh, very few in reserve. We basically have eight in reserve. You see this drug called colistin in the reserve group. This is a last resort antibiotic. This was being used as a growth promoter by Indonesian farmers till 2017, till 2018. So you see the relationship between humans and animals. So the government, when they realized this relationship, they banned the use of antibiotics in growth promoters. And if you go back to the video that we shared with you earlier, that is what the farmer there was referring to. Because till then, these antibiotics were being used by animals, uh, by farmers as growth promoters. Okay, next please. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details of how these antibiotic how these antibiotics were chosen. But I only want to share with you, if you're interested in me, I, with, with interested, I can give you the process. You have the slides, you can read them. But at WHO, we have one principle. Evidence is generated by what we call the grade method. We do not work with expert evidence. In the past, what would happen would be, we would call all the professors, they would come, they would discuss, and they would say, in my practice, I have seen this, 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 this. And then that would become a guideline. WHO was heavily criticized for that because they said that when somebody talks about their practice, they talk about 100, 200 people. But the strength of evidence comes when you do a systematic analysis, a meta-analysis, and you grade the strength of the evidence. Not all studies are equal. What you get from a clinical trial that is randomized, double blind, is different from a study that is done in a hospital with 200 sample size. So we only use the grade process and every antibiotic that you see here went through a grade process. If you see an antibiotic is not there, it is not there because either it is not efficacious, there is a better alternative, or it has a higher toxicity. Next, please. Okay. 
So this is not really important, but just to show you how many countries are adopting the aware classification. Next, please. Okay. Um, now we want to talk about some of the countries uh, that, that have started doing AMS, as in stewardship. What, 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 what are the examples that we know? This is a country in, in Burkina Faso, uh, which is in Africa, in West Africa. It's a French-speaking country. Um, and they started to first identify the data. What's the problem? Let us find the laboratories and start collecting the data. Once they collected the data, they said, this is a problem. We need to have guidelines. And they made sure that there was a guideline for appropriate antibiotic prescribing. Indonesia has a guideline for appropriate antibiotic prescribing. Have any of you seen it? Has anybody been, been able to, to see that, that guideline? No? Okay. Okay. Now, um, they've also started focusing on prevention because antimicrobial stewardship is not just around drugs. It's about sanitation. It's about wash. Very importantly, antimicrobial stewardship is about prevention. If I give you a typhoid vaccination and you don't get typhoid, that is antimicrobial stewardship. So the role of prevention, the role of vaccination is also very important in antimicrobial stewardship. Next, please. This is another example of a country in the Middle East, Jordan, and they have also been doing similar work. And they have a new law in Jordan where they said that pharmacists cannot prescribe antibiotics. You know that in Jogja, there is an agreement now that no pharmacists will sell antibiotics over the counter. In Pontignac, the governor has said there's a decree where there will be no sale of antibiotics over the counter. So we're beginning to see things like this also happening in Indonesia. It's a fully decentralized system and we want everybody to adopt that. In Jakarta, in Java, in Sumatra, everywhere we should have very clear guidelines on the regulations around antibiotics. Now, what's the problem with all of this? The problem with all of this is when people are poor and they cannot go to a hospital, when people are living 20 kilometers from a hospital, when hospitals or the Puskas mask has no staff or they have no drugs, a patient doesn't feel that they want to go and spend five hours there. So what do they do? They go to the drug seller. Sometimes they take the old pill box and said, can you give me this drug? Because last time I took it and I felt better. So with regulation, if you only do regulation, maybe you will not succeed fully because we also need to improve access. We also need to improve the patient's understanding of this issue. So it has to be done on both sides. One is called, in English, we have a slightly rude saying, you know, carrot and stick. You have to give the carrot and you have to give the stick and then things work together. So regulation alone without improved access for patients, improved drugs availability at the lowest level is very important. Next, please. Okay. So what we're sharing with you here is Indonesia's national action plan for antimicrobial resistance. Have any of you had a chance to see this before? Heard of it before? No, okay. So the, the, uh, the country has a plan. The plan is issued under the coordinating ministry uh, for human health. And it has um, uh, several very clear strategies. And this is a multi-sectoral plan. 
covering the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. So now it is up to all of us to see how we can help with the implementation of this plan. We need working groups. We need the environment sector to understand what actions they need to take. We need the Ministry of Education to understand what actions they need to take. Do they want to talk about antimicrobial resistance to students in grade eight? Do they want to change the curriculum of doctors and nurses and pharmacists to make sure that there is a section on antimicrobial resistance? That is something that only the Ministry of Education can act on, but we need to bring them together. In this country, you will be happy to know that it is President Jokovi himself who issued a presidential decree on ending TB. And Pak Pantri Budi Sarekin monitors the TB program every week. We want AMR to get the same attention at the highest level. And to do that, we have to advocate with all the sectors, with environment, with education, uh, with with the with the uh, baden palm with the pharmaceutical industries we need to talk to everybody and say we need to act together we need to act now and unless we do that and we don't create the data we will still be talking about this issue in 20 years and resistance that i showed you which is at 60 70 percent will probably be higher next please so I'd like to end now because I, I, I took the very generous offer from Pa Ahmad and I exceeded my 20 minutes and I'm now at 30 minutes. But I'd like to end now to say that there are new tools that are becoming available for us to understand antibiotics better, for us to use them better. But it is also important that we all come together and we all take responsibility for using antibiotics and saving ourselves and our families and our friends and our children uh, from dying and illness, which is completely preventable in the future. Thank you very much. And I'd like to stop here. Thank you, Shara, for your uh, kind presentation, very uh, clear. And also um, interesting, at least for me, regarding this uh, silent pandemic, like uh, Prof. Skanda mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, I have a lot of questions myself, but I think it would, it would be fair if I could give the audience first. Bagaimana rekan-rekan sekali ada yang mau bertanya duluan? Oke, silakan, Dr. Dikabu. Terima kasih, Pak Ahmad. Boleh bahasa Inggris atau bahasa Indonesia? Kita coba campur aja ya. Uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Dr. Rika. Uh, I'm internist and consultant, uh, tropical uh, infection consultant from Yarsi Hospital. Uh, mungkin supaya lebih enak, mungkin saya bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia. Uh, jadi berdasarkan keterangan dari Mr. Miftah, itu sebenarnya kita sudah aplikasikan. I have application about the classification of the work from uh, uh, WHO, World Health Organization in Yarsi Hospital. And to, to make use the clinician to uh, classification to simple. I have the met, uh, classification, uh, stratification to use the OR uh, antibiotic. Uh, at, uh, example, we use the classification tipe 1 untuk antibiotic cases. We use this uh, first classification for SS antibiotic. And we use the uh, second classification for watch uh, antibiotic classification. And then, and then the short, uh, stratification for the uh, reserve uh, classification. Jadi kami sudah menerapkan 
tiga klasi uh, tiga stratifikasi sorry untuk memilah uh, pemakaian antibiotik apakah kita memakai yang SS apakah kita memakai yang watch atau kita memakai yang reserve jadi untuk memudahkan klinisi kami dari PGA we call in Indonesia uh, antimicrobial stewardship is PGA penata gunaan antibiotik ya yeah. And uh, kemudian uh, ini untuk memudahkan klinisi. Not all of the clinician understand about the OR classification. So uh, uh, I said that we make the stratification to make the clinician to make easy to use the uh, classification form uh, WHO. Ya, jadi kami sudah memilah stratifikasi tadi sehingga memudahkan para klinisi untuk menggunakan tadi. Nah, kemudian untuk uh, kategori yang reserve, memang selama masa pandemi itu banyak pemakaian. Terus terang, ya. During the pandemi of the COVID, we use the reserve uh, antibiotic is overuse. <laughs> overuse. Ya, jadi uh, untuk itu kami lakukan investigasi. We then we investigate about this uh, use of this antibiotic untuk mengurangi pemakaian daripada antibiotik, especially meronem. Ya, setelah itu uh, alhamdulillah terjadi penurunan dari pemakaian meronem. Itu tentang antimikrobial stewardship di rumah sakit YRC Hospital. Kemudian about the uh, uh, kuman ya, yeah, from the data from your case from Indonesia data, uh, uh, apa ya mirip ya yeah. uh, um, kuman yang ada di rumah sakit YRC, ya. Yeah. The most of the microorganism from our culture and resistance is the Klebsiella pneumonia, Acinobacter baumani, and Spirumonas aeruginosa. Ya, jadi itu adalah tiga antibiotik yang paling banyak yang kami dapatkan dari hasil kultur dan resistensi. Jadi mungkin uh, dari data yang sudah didapatkan, sepertinya kita mirip-mirip dengan uh, pola kuman ya uh, yang ada di Indonesia dan tentu juga ada di masa Yarsi. Ya mungkin hanya itu yang bisa saya sampaikan. Terima kasih mungkin banyak masukan buat kami dari PGA. Thank you for your uh, explain, uh, explain about the uh, antibiotic antimicrobial stewardship in Indonesia. Thank you. Terima kasih uh, Dr. Bur. Mungkin kalau boleh klarifikasi juga nih dok. Tadi ketika disampaikan uh, dokter sudah memahami itu maksudnya Dokter di seluruh Indonesia atau di YRC aja atau bagaimana dok? Spesial di YRC ya, spesial. Tapi saya uh, bekerja di tiga rumah sakit. Uh, kemudian saya juga anggota PPRA dan PGA. Uh, jadi ini saya coba terapkan karena tidak semua klinisi uh, hmm. memahami. Not of clinician understand about the OR classification. Hmm. Ya. Yeah. Jadi saya menerapkan ini supaya uh, memudahkan klinisi untuk memilah, mencoose what the kind of the classification of the antibiotik. Yeah. Okay. Baik Dr. Rika, tapi nanti jangan kemana-mana dok ya, kita eh, yeah. diskusinya akan ramai ini kayaknya. <laughs> so uh, let me give the essentials okay. what uh, Dr. Rika actually uh, has shared with us. Uh, she's actually an uh, expert in tropical medicine as well, so uh, hopefully we can have a good discussion. So she said first thing that at least in Yarsi, this classification has been in, in, in force. Yes. So we know what, what to do according to this uh, access to what to reserve. Um, But then it raises the question, um, is it all clinicians? Uh, but then this will be a challenge, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Understand yeah. Yeah. But uh, when, when I look at your, um, who's responsible, okay. I myself, uh, okay. as a parent, <laughs> it's already responsible. And when you say that, uh, thank you, you know, uh, this guy, now in Indonesia, we have online stores. Mm -hmm. uh, we have access to uh, stock this uh, online stores because You know, this, this could be an interesting point. And the second thing she mentioned uh, regarding the reserve and antibiotic has been uh, used mostly in COVID. And this would be a challenge for us because the COVID pandemic would be an issue. And we have to follow up, I don't know, how to monitor this, uh, this issue. And then the last one is uh, uh, the kind of uh, bugs that seems to be resistant is similar to what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. to the yeah. list, right. Okay. So uh, I guess maybe you can comment on this uh, key point. No, I think I'm just very happy to hear that the plan is already done. 
um, you know, in a, in a top university hospital in the center of, of Indonesia, uh, if it's being done, that's fabulous. But as you yourself said, is this something that is happening? Sorry. Is, is this something that is happening at the level of the Puskasmas? Is this something that is happening at the level of district hospital? Um, how can we take good practice in the country and share it? How can we make it the norm? Um, these are some of the questions and challenges that we will have to, to work with. Um, of course, one way is a lot of training, uh, but it's also training for the users. So we need a big campaign which will speak to the various sectors. Um, and, and I think this is where we have to do the work. Um, and we will be looking for your guidance, your leadership based on your experience. How can it be used, that experience? How can that classification that you have be used at the Puskas mask? How can it be used at a lower level? So we need that. We need to identify good practice. We need to make it available and understandable to everybody. And we need to contextualize, depending on the health facility, depending on the resources. There are some Puskas masses where you may not have enough staff. You may not be able to do basic diagnostics. How do you apply this classification to syndromes? If you don't have a diagnostic and you don't have a test, how do you teach a doctor to say, this bronchitis is viral? You don't need antibiotics. This one is bacterial. You need antibiotics. That kind of guidance is also needed. And the challenge I face when I look at the guidelines often, they assume that the diagnosis is already done. And we know in many of the district uh, laboratories, we don't have tests or health insurance is not able to pay for the test uh, or the patient is not insured and they don't want to spend money on the test. So what should the doctor do then? You don't have a test. Should you say, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to give them every antibiotic possible because I'm afraid I have to cover everything. Or can we help the doctor to have more confidence to be able to reassure the patient and say, in three days, you will feel better and give them symptomatic treatment. <laughs> can we use telemedicine to allow the doctor to follow up rather than waiting for the patient to come? How do we improve access? So these are bigger questions that I think need to be discussed in the country by the health ministry, by the big universities. Uh, this is what we need to be teaching in public health. All of our public health courses should have a module on antimicrobial resistance now. I'll stop, yeah. Uh, thank you. But I probably want to uh, raise some of the uh, practical issue as well. Um, for instance, when kids when sick or we got sick because you know, they see them. And obviously what we want to do is to get back to work as soon as possible, right? And in, in, I guess in my experience, uh, people will say, okay, let me take amoxicillin. And amoxicillin, apparently you can take the uh, uh, local store and get it. Is there actually some sort of study, if you just withhold your symptoms and let it go by itself, the loss of productivity, and compared to the risk of antibiotic resistance due to this amoxicillin, or is it amoxicillin? Amoxicillin. Yeah, amoxicillin. This is really an issue. Is it because the consumption of it or the not right way to consume? For instance, instead of uh, consuming it for five days, people just take it for two days, feel better, then they take it away. So, how to, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Richard, could you maybe give some issue about this uh, practical thing, about uh, antibiotics, thing, uh, especially among parents? <laughs> Uh, sorry, yang terakhir apa? Kurang pemakaian antibiotik ya? Oh iya, jadi uh, ketika orang sakit itu kan kadang mau cepat sembuh gitu. Dan supaya cepat sembuh biasanya mereka minum antibiotik gitu kan. 
Nah, ini sekarang masalahnya ketika penggunaan antibiotik itu, apakah penggunaan yang tidak tepat, jadi misalnya harusnya full dosis, tapi mereka baru dua hari udah pasal bagus, terus mereka nggak minum. Atau memang penggunaan antibiotiknya sendiri, yang amoxicillin itu harusnya memang udah harus di, di, di apa, dihentikan atau bagaimana. gitu jadi Karena ini kan umum ya, di masyarakat itu, kita ke apotek, bahkan tanpa resep dokter bisa beli itu antibiotik yeah. amoxicillin. Ya, gimana dok? Yeah. Terima, terima kasih, thank you. Uh, amoxicillin Indonesia is the uh, excess classification di Indonesia. Ya, yeah. jadi uh, pemakaian antibiotik saat ini amoxicillin tidak terlalu banyak pemakaian antibiotiknya. Yang dari pengalaman saya ya, based on our experience, uh, uh, the clinician uh, the the use of the amoxicillin not not too much. They use the uh, for the patient, uh, but karena antibiotik itu ini uh, di Indonesia kalau itu boleh di karena di akses termasuk golongan akses itu boleh diresepkan oleh GP ya yeah. because the amoxicillin is the uh, excess classification in Indonesia is general practice can use the amoxicillin without the recommendation from the uh, consultant or other clinician ya yeah. jadi sejauh sejauh pengalaman saya tidak ada pemakaian amoxicillin sudah agak jauh kurang justru menjadi tantangan Challenge well, for us is the use the reserve classification for uh, of clinician. I think it's uh, the worst condition if we, we don't protect this condition for the future. Yeah, makasih. Terima kasih, Dr. Uh, is it okay then with the use of this amoxicillin? So I think that you know um, amoxicillin is not a sweet. It should not be given to all the children every time they sneeze and cough. What tends to happen is that a mother who comes with a child to the hospital is reacting to the symptoms of the child. My child has fever. My child is coughing and is not able to sleep. Uh, my child is, is not able to go to school. I am not able to go to work because my child is not able to go to school. What can I do to make the child feel better as quickly as possible? So the mother is not interested in whether you gave them an antibiotic, an antiviral or whatever. The mother is interested in what can I do to make my child feel better as quickly as possible? As a doctor, our responsibility is to say, this is a clear case of bronchitis brought on by rhinovirus, adenovirus, SARS-CoV-2. We know that the vast majority of them are viral. Child doesn't have systemic problems, doesn't have a respiratory rate over 30, uh, is eating, drinking. The doctor should then be able to have a conversation with a parent to say, no antibiotics. The problem is that many people are not making the decision against antibiotics. The problem is many people are saying that, oh, as a first line, I'll give you amoxicillin. So we are not even protecting the amoxicillin because we say it's an access drug. We don't need to protect it, but it should be the other way around. It is our first access drug. We should be protecting it. So this is the problem. And I can tell you that I have children. I'm a working mother. When my children are sick, it's a real problem. And um, um, I would go to the GP. My son had fever, <coughs> coughing, no antibiotics. I instantly phoned India, where you can buy anything for anybody. I'm talking about 10 years ago. So, you know, can you send me something in, in, in for one week? The GP said, no, 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 no. Seventh day, suddenly the child was absolutely well. And you will see this in viral diseases. So the bacterial fever will come down slowly. Virus, one day gone, suddenly fever gone. So three days, four days, we know that it's not lived. What makes that doctor have the courage to say to me, no, I will not give you antibiotics. His antibiotic description is being monitored. 
In the UK now, every doctor's antibiotic prescription is monitored. And you can see who is prescribing the most. And then you can begin to say, okay, what's going on? So there is also a behavioral component and a negotiation component that we need to take note of. So now comes the question of what works. How can you as a doctor engage with other doctors, with patients to change the social norm? Right now, the social norm is give a moxicillin. How do we change the social norm to say viral disease, a moxicillin not needed? How do we speak to a parent like me who say, listen, sorry, I have to go to work. I don't have time, you know, give, give the child. Yes. Uh, there are plenty of studies that are showing that antibiotics cannot shorten the duration of antiviral, uh, viral infection, right? So that is the problem. The second is, People are not even giving a lot of People start with azithromycin. Azithromycin is a wash drug. In India, people are starting with azithromycin. Amoxicillin, because they probably know the level of resistance or whatever, they just forget it. He starts straight with azithromycin. In fact, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which is a nodal agency in that COVID guideline, said, we'll give you azithromycin. Why? because you might have a second infection. If you're fully vaccinated, you are young, you don't have diabetes, you're not a woman. Most likely, you will have a mild infection. Treat the infection when the infection comes. Don't preempt an infection that has not come and already ask them to start taking the diseases, uh, the, 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 the medication. So that is the challenge, how to have that conversation and how to convince people. And doctors are under pressure. They have 20 people to see in 10 minutes. They don't have time for this conversation, right? So who has to have the conversation? It should be the pharmacy. So we really have to be working much more with the pharmacists and the nurses to make sure that they are spending time on this issue. Because for a doctor, you could say, you know, I have six hundred patients. In, in India, a doctor at the Ola Institute of Medical Sciences in Bangladesh, you would sometimes see 600 patients in a day. So what would you see? Everybody, you know, you would spend 30 seconds, you coughing with a moxicillin, basic more go home. That's the issue. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Yeah, I think apa pada dalam bahasa Indonesia itu mengubah perilaku ya dari social behavior change itu perilaku itu emang paling sulit masker ini kan susah banget ya di zaman covid ini tapi kalau udah kena baru ngerasa ini harus kena dulu <laughs> bisa berubah perilaku um, kita akan we'll go to the online uh, question uh, from Bumaya Ganisa okay. control the use of antibiotic by doctor prescribes any control system to evaluate their practice on giving antibiotic prescription to minimize the level of resistance it's interesting because maybe in uk they've been monitoring but any other perspective maybe in other maybe in uh, lmic and see had the huh? no, uh, because he had a fever oh she's a, she's a fever oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all right there are there are there are two or three uh, interventions around how to support behavior change for physicians and providers, which have been written. Yeah. So there are two or three interventions. And, and having that AMS committee, having a consultant always authorize the use of a reserve drug, monitoring who's prescribing, looking at the patterns, um, and then creating peer pressure. We know peer pressure works very well in many things. Creating peer pressure is also a very important thing. So not just monitoring, but then creating a constitu uh, an institutional level, um, an institutional level um, uh, uh, competition to say, how quickly do we bring down the use of our antibiotics? In, uh, in in the UK, in the last 10 years, it's come down by almost 25% because it has now been incentivized. Some hospitals funding is also linked to how well they are following antimicrobial stewardship practices. So there's a role for behavior change, there's a role for enforcement, and there's a role for incentives, all three. 
working together. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Umaya, lakas sembuh ya. <laughs> Kita doakan semua lagi agar she has a fever. That's why she's at home. Okay, next question from uh, Dwi Sulistianingsi. Uh, Bu Dwi bertanya, bagaimana langkah yang diambil untuk resistensi antibiotik ini? Metode dari Burkina Faso atau Jordan belum tentu bisa diterapkan di semua negara. Apakah nanti tiap negara perlu guideline tersendiri? So her question uh, is about the, the strategy. Uh, you mentioned the strategy in Burkina Faso, the strategy in, in Jordan. Um, she asked, it may not be applicable to all countries because we have different uh, situation and condition. Um, how would you suggest, you've been working in Indonesia and you mentioned about you know, some of the uh, commitment Indonesia has. I guess the question would be, this guideline, do they have any dashboard or indicators that they've been working, that they're actually committed, not just in papers, but this is a question you can answer better than me, <laughs> but I can tell you Indonesia has a very good strategy. It follows the global action plan very closely, but it has added one other strategy, which is governance. There's a sixth strategy which says we need to talk to each other. We need to work together. The issue right now is uh, that you need to have uh, a clear home for AMR. You need to have a programmatic approach for AMR. Um, we also have a situation where you're looking at a fully decentralized country. Um, so do we need to really be working at the province level? Uh, do we need to be working much more with the governors? And what is the structure for doing that? Uh, can we only depend on the Ministry of Health at the national level for that? Uh, we know that the Ministry of Home is very important. How do we bring in the home ministry into the conversation? So she's absolutely right that the strategies in Burkina Faso, Jordan are not the strategies that can automatically be used here. But if you look at the big issues, governance, coordination, the use of regulations, um, how we work with health insurance. You know, we have, we, we have systems in health insurance, BPJS, for example, where you will say, unless, the patient is still suffering for three days or four days, you don't need to do culture. The hospital is not being reimbursed for culture. Even in, 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 in sometimes in, in, in situations where in other countries you would start with culture because it's a cost. So these are some of the issues that we need to think about uh, and advocate with. And if we went to BPJS and we showed them the data and said, it's a question of pay now, or pay later. Today you will pay for early diagnosis, tomorrow you will pay for reserve drugs. Which one is better? But we have to create that information. We have to create the advocacy data. And that is why I keep saying it comes down to data, not just surveillance, not the bugs, but data for action is something that we need to help people to make the right decisions. And people want to make the right decisions. The strategy is good. People want to do the right thing. The guidance on what to do and how it suits the context in Indonesia can only come from Indonesia. They know the context, but Papa, this time I can help. <laughs> oh, yes, still I can. Uh, <laughs> I agree with uh, you, uh, ma'am uh, Mokhtar. Uh, I never use antibiotics uh, as as long as uh, there's a virus. Saya pakai bahasa Indonesia aja ya. Jadi saya dari klinik Vaskes Primer itu kalau BPJS memang terbatas sekali untuk penggunaan uh, obat-obatan. Yang saya ingin tanyakan tadi ada kategori akses tadi itu ada ampicillin. Uh, ampicillin itu sepengetahuan kami sudah tidak digunakan lagi. Apakah masih masuk di dalam kategori tersebut? Itu saya. Apa sih? Thank you. 
Yeah, so uh, see, please, if, if you, so we need more questions, but <laughs> there's a question. So see, uh, she mentioned that there's in a list is ampicillin. Uh, ampicillin, yeah? Okay. okay. Nah, itu masih di list, tapi di Indonesia sudah dipakai lagi. Yeah, but we don't use it anymore. Um, is it necessarily to be in the list? Then the pathology is part of the Oh, yeah. this is from the uh, primary uh, institution, uh, healthcare. So, is it not on the Indonesian essential drug list? Yeah. Uh, it has been removed from the drug list? Oh, that there's a lot of resistance yeah. to ampicillin, that's yeah. why it's been removed? Yeah. Okay, so I think that's again, if you have good data in the country, that shows that there is a lot of resistance to ampicillin, then it makes sense that you remove it. But if you don't have good data, and I think at the moment we don't have national data on this issue, then it becomes a problem because you're taking a drug which may be useful in some other parts of Indonesia off the list. So it comes to the question of, is the data there? And Normally, for clinical purposes, you will have your hospital's data if you're monitoring all of your uh, resistance to say what is happening in my hospital. But even more important, you need data from the community. And at the moment, we don't have data from the community. We only have data from hospitals. So unless we can really change and bring data from the Puskas mass level to the resistance, from the district hospitals, we cannot decide whether there is a lot of resistance or not. Yes, in hospitals, you will get more resistance because you're getting the sickest and patients who've been, uh, who's, who've been exposed to antibiotics more frequently. So yes, I think uh, I, I will look at this issue of ampicillin and I will come back to you. But uh, from a WHO perspective, it is still a really important and useful drug. Uh, so it is on the essential drug list, but you may be right that the resistance in Indonesia is very high. Jadi ampicillinnya itu coba klarifikasi dulu. Ampicillinnya itu sebenarnya ter tidak tersedia, tapi dibutuhkan, atau memang sudah tidak dibutuhkan lagi? Atau yang mana, dok? Oh, tidak tersedia ya? Padahal dibutuhkan. Oh, enggak juga. Oh, oke. Okay. Oh, oke. Okay. Tapi kan memang nggak dibutuhkan ya. Jadi akhirnya. Oh, oke, okay, oke, okay, oke. Okay. Ya, nah, saya pikir tadi ini apa namanya? Sebetulnya sangat dibutuhkan, tetapi kok nggak available. Gitu. Tapi sebetulnya ini masalahnya bukan itu ya. Itu memang karena memang tidak dibutuhkan lagi. Oke. Okay. Ya, yeah, this also an interesting twist to it. So apparently, ampicillin itself is not. Uh, needed in Indonesia, uh, right? So that's why uh, it's, it's off the list, not because of resistance, but because it's not needed. You don't have the infection for which they're being used. Yes, right. That's, that's the, the, the issue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, oh, ada pertanyaan. Untung ada pertanyaan. Kalau nggak ada pertanyaan, saya nggak nanya biasanya. <laughs> saya nanya audience. <laughs> Silakan, uh, Dr. Anggra. This is a clinical pathologist. Thank you. Uh, as you talk about the problem in Puskesmas, I think uh, the problem is Puskesmas doesn't have access or ability to uh, differentiate whether there is a viral infection or a bacterial infection. I think the role of uh, symptom and the, the important thing is the role of laboratory test to differentiate the in viral infection uh, between viral infection and bacterial infection. Maybe if the the, the put test mask uh, has the uh, basic laboratory test such as pathology test that can uh, count the lymphocyte count or 
lekot uh, lekot uh, type uh, I think lymphocyte uh, in viral infection the lymphocyte will will uh, increase I think the problem in Puskesmas there's no uh, or limitation to get the laboratory test and in the uh, primary hospital in big hospital they also have the act, the ability to uh, check the antibiotic uh, susceptibility test and the role in laboratory is to classify the laboratory um, antimicrobial susceptibility test differentiate into first line second line and third line that's what i apply in my laboratory to give the result uh, this antibiotic is first line or uh, this is second line so the clinician can choose whether the first antibiotic for the first treatment and keep the uh, research antibiotic to the next or the in, in the, uh, or the in, in the emergency uh, situation i think the problem is okay. i think you're absolutely right uh, and you've hit the nail on the head that at the primary care level often clinicians don't have the tools or the experience to be able to differentiate between the viral and the bacterial infections. And do we think that every Puskas mass should have a lab or the rapid tests to do every, every infection, every community acquired infection? My answer would be yes, but we know that that's not the reality. It will not happen. We have this new WHO aware antibiotic book that I was telling you about that we're translating into Bahasa now. And this is exactly what the book is trying to do. The book is saying, how do you help the clinician to distinguish between viral bronchitis or bacterial bronchitis? How do you help a clinician to say, this is mild pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, and you may not need antibiotics. Uh, if these are the symptoms. So we have taken 30 primary care community acquired syndromes and we are helping the clinician to say, what is the likely pathogen? What are the likely symptoms? What should the treatment be? How should it be different between a decision to take antibiotics or only symptomatic? How should it be different between children and adults? What should be the duration? And you will see now increasingly for almost all antibiotics, the research is showing that the duration needs to be shorter and shorter. We are seeing for surgery now that in some cases, they're saying no antibiotics needed at all. In, in severe important surgeries, the duration is often one or two days now. So overall, this is the purpose of the book to address this problem of how do we diagnose, what do I diagnose? In this book, we also have 16 hospital acquired infections. So we have primary care and hospital acquired infections, excluding ICU, because what we'll be colonizing in ICU is very different from facility to facility and WHO can't give broad guidance for that. I have a copy of the book uh, uh, as, as a soft copy. As I said, we're translating, and this is what, this is the problem we are trying to solve, exactly the problem that you're trying to solve. Pak Mantri has this transformation agenda, and one of the agendas is precision medicine and strengthening public health lab. And at WHO, we are working to support that, to say, how do you strengthen lab at the Puskasmas at the district level, so that clinicians have the tools to take the right decision, to give people the right medicine. As you know, Pak Mantri is also very interested in whole genome sequencing. Uh, of course, it will take some time 
by the time you can set up the system for whole genome sequencing to benefit the patients on the ground. But that is the direction in which we want to go to. We want to go to a direction where we can diagnose at the lowest level, we can diagnose quickly, and we need to be able to say, for example, okay, this patient is resistant to this, but we also need to be able to say, what is this patient not resistant to? And what you are doing is great practice to say, these are the susceptibles, and these are first line, second line, third line options. Actually, I would go the next step and say, patient is susceptible to first line, that's it. Nothing else should be given, right? And the clinician has to be accountable. If you are susceptible to a first line drug, why has the clinician prescribed the watch drug? Um, and that is the role of the AMS committee to, to, for somebody to say, but there's no need. Um, we have to accept that there is a commercial influence in the practice of many doctors. We have to accept that it's a reality, which is not to say that people are not, not, not good. But you know, when you have the pharmaceutical company chasing you and saying, let's go to Singapore and I'll give you this and you prescribe this drug, we know it's a reality. That is why there is a need for accountability and an AMS stewardship committee in every hospital to say, these are our practices. This is what we want to follow. These are our values. And our values are patient efficacy first, reduce toxicity, saving antibiotics for the future. May I add it? Um? Yes, yes, please. <clears throat> uh, I think a uh, medical, medical practitioner in, in uh, primary care uh, knows about it, I think, yeah, because uh, we are in uh academic center uh, we we teach students medical students to differentiate between uh, virus and bacterial infection and virus uh, should not uh, give antibiotics i think all the doctors know that uh maybe the problem is uh actually in primary care uh the patient yeah the <laughs> apa yeah uh, the patient put yeah to oh, or, or maybe the doctor also also uh, need to to trial and error maybe and then no no facility uh, to check the to differentiate uh, the infection and as the laboratory association in Indonesia uh, where I'm member of that uh, all the laboratory facility in puskesmas and in primary care should have the basic uh, the basic uh, laboratory check like like hematology test and the like a rapid viral infection like ns1 or dengue uh, igg igm in uh, primary care yeah yeah uh, that's that's right and um, just to add up on that uh, but Woody's uh, initiative, yes, it's BGSI, uh, is very bold and to transform this uh, Indonesian uh, infrastructure. We're going to see some changes, hopefully. Yeah. In fact, he's thinking about putting minions, uh, the NGS minion, nanopore on all this primary to catch the MDR TB. But we'll see uh, how it's going to work out. It's going to be very exciting, I'm, I'm sure. Okay. Um, so. Let's, there's another question from the uh, online uh, audience uh, from Ibu Nurul Istikoma, uh, Dada Sharma. Uh, she asked about the nutrition factor. Um, her question is about whether the, effect, the efficacy of the antibiotics also depending on the nutrition status of the patients. Yes or no? We know from TB, for instance, you see, take an example of TB. TB is also related to the nutrition, uh, I suppose, but is it also affecting the efficacy of the antibiotics? Or we should have a good nutrition to prevent TB in the first place? So we have the TB experts sitting here and they can answer this question, but I will only say two things. She's right. There is a very clear relationship between infectious diseases and malnourishment. We are seeing in countries like India about 40 to 45% of the TB cases that are coming to us 
are coming related to undernutrition. So clearly, if you're undernourished, you have a BMI below 19, you are going to have a much higher you know, uh, uh, thing of getting TB. Because when your nutrition is limited, you will transition from having the TB infection to having the TB disease. Now what we do for that is we say we prevent TB. We give people therapy again with antibiotics and other drugs to stop them from having latent TB uh, and then going to actual infectious diseases. The reverse is also true. You send somebody who has TB, you put them on treatment, they start putting on weight. So their nutrition actually improves. Their health actually improves because they're able to put on weight, they're able to eat more, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the question of the efficacy of antibiotics related to nutrition, I think this is a much more complex question. I'm not actually fully uh, you know, in, in a good place to answer those questions, but I will say this, that your dose needs to be identified very clearly with your weight bands. And this is very important, particularly in children, because this is where a lot of mistakes are made. Weight bands for children are often not clear to people, and often in situations where children are stunted um, and, and are underweight, the clinician may not be sure about how to dose and what to dose with. So it's an important relationship. It's a symbiotic relationship. It works on both sides. Um, and, and sometimes you will find that uh, antibiotics will in fact improve nutrition um, uh, and, and your weight will go up uh, because it will stop the parasite that is, that is, that is bothering you uh, and allow you to absorb nutrition. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma. Prof. Aditama, would you like anything to add? No? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me check on my questions. Oh, okay. Uh, no, because because he was positive few days ago. <laughs> okay, I have two uh, question. Not really question, but ask your suggestion. I don't know whether it's already asked or not before. Uh, as we know from the very beginning, uh, some of the participants of this meeting is our master and PhD student of biomedical of this university. And most, some of them, or most of the PhD students are now trying to find the title of their thesis. So uh, I looks like AMR is not so sexy in a sense, not so popular for students. So could you kindly give an idea what kind of AMR research are you know feasible and can, I mean, can do, but also have a big impact for, not only for research, but also for the country. That's my first, but please answer the first one. We have hundreds of questions that are unanswered. Um, for example, um, we know nothing about the environment and AMR in Indonesia. How is wastewater managed? Uh, how can we set up environmental surveillance for, for AMR in wastewater? What are the pathogens that we need to be looking at? Um, what is happening in, in, the, in the markets, in the wet markets? Um, what is the relationship between food hygiene and resistance in, in the wet markets of, of Sulawesi? Um, what is the knowledge attitude and practice of primary health care uh, um, uh, providers on AMR? We don't know. We have no idea. So I think there are lots and lots of questions that can be asked. And one of the things that the country should be doing is having a very clear research agenda for AMR, like we do for TB. We have questions which are, these are the key research questions. So you can have research questions that are epidemiological, but you could also have policy research. What are the regulations that have been put into place to support AMR? Uh, why are they not implemented? 
how many times was a regulation implemented and what was the result? Um, so I think, you know, you can do policy research. You can also do modeling and investment case research. What is the cost of AMR for a particular disease in the Indonesian setting? Um, and lots and lots of questions around infection prevention and control. Um, what are the good practices? What are the barriers? What are the challenges? So we can give you a list, we can discuss. Um, and at the moment, one of our problems as WHO is we are only able to access information in the English language. We do not know what is being printed and published in terms of research and science in Indonesia. A simple review of the information. You know, if somebody could say, for example, to the environment ministry, we looked at the information and the data from the last year's five, five year papers. This is what we found. This is what we found from your books that was on the website, that this is the situation. That is really helpful for the country, simply being able to say, what is the situation? What do we know? That would be very useful to us. So I'll stop and I hope I've answered your question, but we are very happy to engage much more on this. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned about BPJS, okay? So the office of BPJS is just nearby. That's number one. And the chair of BPJS was our guest speaker on the, what is uh, our, our uh, uh, graduation day a few weeks ago, just several days because uh, before I got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> and she also, he also mentioned, he has a lot of data that, that a university can utilize uh, uh, for for anything for research. So I'm just thinking we could. By the way, uh, my, the student here is more by in bi biomedical aspect. It's not really epidemiological, but we, we we can arrange that one. So so there is an issue of research is really needed. We have a student here, BPJS is nearby, and he said it's you are very much welcome to come. And you also said that. The role of BPJS is also important in AMR in general because of the issue of, of reimbursement, etc. So I'm just uh, suggesting that we work on this one, on this possibility. Okay, thank you. I think that's just, please excuse me, a very important uh, thing. BPJS has a lot of data, uh, but all the programs say, we don't know what BPJS has because we don't have access to it. We also may have information only at the national level, not at the subnational level. And so any conversation around data sharing is good. But at this stage, if we can answer two simple questions, just for TB, for example, or you choose any disease and you say, how many tests were done for drug resistance that you paid for? And at what point in time were they done? That can give you a real sense of what is actually happening there. And we can use that data to say, you need to pay for these tests because when you're not paying for these tests now, you'll be paying later and do some modeling for them. So if I can get that simple question answered, that would be really helpful. It will really help the programs. Great, thank you, uh, Prof. Aditama, for asking that. So hopefully students, yeah, the uh, uh, doctor students, there will be a good time to start thinking about uh, the question, research questions. Um, okay, I guess we still have maybe a few minutes left. Actually, I have a flight at 2.55. Oh, I do. <laughs> and it's an international flight. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Shem. But maybe one question I want to ask our vice rector, Dr. Bening. Uh, karena ini kan anti-bacterial kita harus lihat juga dari hulunya ya. Um, we are wondering the curriculum for our students, our medical students, is it already incorporates awareness uh, about the AMR? And when they went to these villages to do this uh, KKN, is it already part of the program? And any experience uh, you want to share with us? Thank you. Maybe I will talk in Bahasa. I'm sorry. Okay. Baik, uh, untuk kurikulum tentang uh, resistensi antibiotik, sebetulnya sejak awal 
Jadi di semester 2 itu mahasiswa sudah mendapatkan teori dari aspek mikrobiologi dan farmakologi tentang mekanisme resistensi obat begitu. Nah, jadi eh, kemudian memang yang masih mungkin belum kita eh, tekankan karena kalau dari farmako dan mikro kan lebih pada keilmuan terkait obat dan eh, ininya ya apa eh, bakterinya begitu. Nah, lebih mungkin ke secara epidemiologis ini gitu. Jadi bagaimana mengubah perilaku itu kan ternyata poin yang sangat penting gitu mengubah perilaku masyarakat supaya tidak sedikit-sedikit minta antibiotik gitu karena betul tadi yang disampaikan bahwa patient push doctor to get uh, antibiotik gitu so uh, jadi ini uh, ide yang sangat bagus sekali gitu bahwa kita juga bisa menginsertkan ke kurikulum tentang uh, apa pencegahan resistensi antibiotik dari aspek perubahan perilaku ini bisa saya rasa masuk di blok kedokteran keluarga atau kedokteran komunitas gitu kan dan ini juga uh, bisa masuk juga ke mungkin saat ini memang kita ada KKN reguler insya Allah mungkin minggu depan kita akan berangkat sebagian besar mahasiswa kedokteran nanti bisa kita titipkan pesan ini bahwa mereka bisa memberikan uh, sebagian dari program kerjanya edukasi untuk uh, awareness terhadap resistensi antibiotik ini mungkin demikian Pak Ahmad terima kasih ya. kenapa ya, Uh, rencananya di Kecamatan Koja sama Cilincing, Jakarta Utara. Pak. Oke, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm sure I must have lost one question, but uh, Dr. Sharma has uh, a flight to catch, an international flight. So we thank you, Dr. Sharma. Please uh, join me in uh, giving our good round of applause. Uh, thank you so much. Hopefully, we can uh, collaborate further in research or also to raise awareness about this very important issue. So, uh, kepada yang di uh, online, rekan-rekan sekalian, akhirnya kita ada di penghujung acara. Kita tutup dengan istighfar, astagfirullahaladzim, dan doa kepada majlis. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdi, kasyadu an la ilaih, astagfirullahaladzim, wa'adu bilaih. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. We are going to thank you for moderator and our lecture, very important and interesting uh, lecture. And now, uh, Dr. Wening, please uh, come forward to give the certificate to the uh, speaker and moderator. Thank you. This is my honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oni. All right. Thank you. Uh, so much for your attention and see you in the next occasion. On behalf of our team, we apologize for any mistake and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, see you again. And uh, before closing, we have take picture together.